Hi, I'm Dan Coffin, owner of SPNC Corp and certified professional agronomist. And I'd like to talk to you specifically about corn foliar feeding, because there are a number of things that, that we need to help people understand about how you can be successful and what the timing is. Uh, because there are different types of corn and different types of needs for foliar feeds for those corns. Uh, and pe many people don't realize that. Uh, in, in the world of corn, corn is not corn. There are three major types of corn. There are workhorse corns, there are what we call intermediate style corns, and then there are racehorse corns. And the workhorse corns are ones that typically are more defensive in, in, their, in their nature. They typically make more of a fixed ear type. The intermediate corns, of course, uh, they can they can be um, flex eared corns. They can be flex both ways, uh, around and long. Um, and then typically we think of the racehorse corns, typically maybe not as quite as much around, but very, very long. If we think about old, old style uh, racehorse corns that were very, very long numbers of kernels long. We call them type ones, type twos, and type threes, and type ones being the workhorse and type three being the racehorse, type two being an intermediate. And those corns do different things at different times. And so the reason I say about corn and foliar feeding is because all the corns are going to set their yield by V3 to V5, very, very small corns. By V3, they've determined the total number of rows around. By V5, they've typically determined the number of kernels long. Phosphorus and micronutrients are what help you develop the energy to get the, the corns to go around. Nitrogen in the ammonium form, amine or ammonium form, is what lengthens your ears. Nitrate does not participate in anything really reproductive, only from if, there, if there's enzymes in there that convert that nitrate back into amine forms or ammonium forms. It's called nitrate reductase. There's your homework assignment. Go find out what nitrate reductase is. But if you, if you understand that, then all kinds of things begin to make sense when you figure out what you're trying to do with a young plant. So normally what we try to do is help people set up planters to develop the stuff in the furrow so that they can control what's going on with that plant at that time and not worry so much about whether or not I can get back over these crops. Uh, a number of the, the, the large uh, high yield seekers have been using primer sprays. And in the primer sprays, we put lots of carbon, we put lots of ethylene inhibitors, we put lots of energy, we put micronutrients in there, we put a little nitrogen, we put some of that stuff in there. So if you're a guy that doesn't want to mess around with that and you want to do primer sprays, you need to do that around V3 because again, V3, you're, you're finishing the rows around and you're, and you're doing the kernels long. So those primer sprays need to be put on early or they need to be put on uh, at or near pollination. But the whole point is, uh, you've heard people talk about doing fungicide activity by V5. Well, if you've got major fungal like anthracnose after very, very wet conditions, and you physically see anthracnose on your plants, you've seen some evidence, then fungicide at that time is going to pay off. Oftentimes, if a fungicide pays off, which is very, very rare, I only know of a very few people who've ever gotten that response to work. Oftentimes, it's because of the ethylene inhibition that we see at that time. So it's helping the plants fight off stress, conserve energy, and as a result, make a bigger ear. That happens. But you don't have to spend that money on big fungicide applications. You can do it with ethylene inhibitors for $2 an acre, a little bit of sugar for probably a buck and a half an acre, and or a little bit of micronutrients or some foliar urea nitrogen for another buck or two an acre. So half or a third of the cost of what the fungicide might cost you and have a better chance at making things happen. But most people don't realize that because corn is doing all this stuff at a very small stage, there is an application you can make early in the season on corn and get paid. The other thing that's important is because at that point, you know, you're spraying everything over the surface and people have this idea that, well, I'm wasting stuff. Well, you could make that case and point, but it's not critical. However, you can go, if you have your own sprayer, you can go buy banded sprayer nozzles so that you can drop the boom down and only cover about nine or 10 inches of width. So you can take the rates down by a half or a third, spray them as a band over the row at a lower rate. So if, if, if we had a $12 program, we can reduce that program down to six or $8 an acre just by putting on different nozzles. Now, if you're a guy that's lucky and you have one of those 120 foot booms, those nozzles are going to cost you $6,000. But I had a guy last year, two years ago, who he called up in the, in the afternoon. He's like, send me that stuff. I checked on the nozzles. Yeah, they were six grand, but I'm going to save 12 grand immediately by cutting the rates down. So he paid for the nozzles the next day 
As a result, he sprayed twice. He liked the savings of what he did, and he liked the reactions of how the plants came to him. So he sprayed twice for no, essentially no more money and got a very, very good return on investment at the end of the year as a result. So timing and the products that you can put in there are huge. The other thing you have to understand, and I failed to mention this on the general foliar feeding, foliar feeding is about six to times more efficient than soil application. So if you're thinking about, let's say, well, we add up, uh, let's say we put on two pounds of nitrogen per acre on a foliar feed. How does two pounds do anything? Well, two pounds foliar fed because of its efficiency and the increase in uptake and how long it lasts, you know, would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, um, somewhere around, uh, well, let's see if it's six to 10 times more, uh, that's somewhere between 12 and 20 units of soil applied nitrogen. So because it's the right form, because it goes in quickly, because it does the right things and helps the plant make, make bigger corrections, it's a huge difference. And the cost might be somewhere in the vicinity of the same or less for the foliar as it would be for soil applied nitrogen, especially with, with the way the nitrogen costs have gone through the roof. So understanding what to do on those crops is important. The other thing is timing. So uh, what one of the guys that, that I, who's long since passed, who did some research years ago, uh, taught us, is when we're looking for workhorse hybrids, or looking at workhorse hybrids, the hybrids that are more fixed in nature, anything that, that you're applying foliar needs to be applied before pollination on those workhorse hybrids because they're going to do most of their work by the time they get to pollination. So they have their needs in an earlier part of the season. If they're intermediate style hybrids, a very, very interesting flex combination, they need to be sprayed right around pollination. Uh, if they're racehorse corns, they can be sprayed at or after pollination for the biggest bang for the buck because racehorse corns need most of their things at or after pollination right during early grain fill. That's when they'll, they'll fill up with stuff as much as six weeks post pollination. That's why racehorse corns need late season water to give them ammonium nitrogen or amine forms of nitrogen. That nitrate that comes at that time is useless to you absolutely useless. As a matter of fact, it's not a zero value. It's negative because you included those nitrates in the total numbers of nitrogen units and you thought they were important. But when you do a late season stock nitrate test and find out that the nitrates are off the scale because nitrates can't move from the base of that plant all the way up to the kernels, you wasted money. So foliar treatments can include something like kelp. Kelp contains that magic homework thing I told you about nitrate reductase. Kelp can help you take some nitrates that are sitting in the bottom of your stock and are not available to you, convert them right in the stock and move them up to kernels. So you can actually make nitrogen that's doing nothing become nitrogen valuable and move to kernels and make you test weight. And that gives you yield. So foliar feeding early and foliar feeding around pollination along with missing nutrients that you know are missing or those that you've measured in tissue analysis and you and suspect to be low or nitrogen in the form of urea or ammonium nitrogen or amino acid forms of nitrogen. Those are very, very highly efficient forms that can give you a big bang for the buck with very, very limited amounts of, of investment. You can even get slow release nitrogen. They have a product, we have a product called Super 72 that we sell, which is a, a triazone urea. Um, those are very slow ureas that will last over a period of 20 days. And so uh, if you want something immediate, you put on urea, uh, ammonium sulfate, there's all different kinds of, of choices you have. If you want something that's slowed down, you can use those triazones and they'll last over an extended period. Most people are telling me, I, I'm going to put it on, I want it to go right to the kernels. But if you're pre-pollination because you had to do something for a fungicide and you want it to last a little longer than that Super 72, makes perfect sense to put in at that time. Micronutrients are important, especially zinc for water management, boron for sugar flow, manganese and or copper for disease resistance. Um, and all of those can help you make test weight. And at any point, if you want to put in nitrogen, urea forms or ammonium forms are superior. Does it, uh, you can put in phosphate. You don't have to. Phosphate helps raise the energy levels. I typically refer uh, to, to sugars or fulvic acids to raise the energy levels at that point. But if you want N, P, and K, you need something that's high in orthophosphate. You're not using 1034O at this point to do anything. That's going to burn the living dickens out of things. And it's not going to help you at all or very limited. It's going to burn the leaves badly. So you want something that, that uh, is built to, to do that. So a lot of things to learn about corn foliar. Trust me, we've been doing this a long time. And you don't hit it right every year. This is a hit and miss because a lot of this goes along with the weather. 
But for what we're investing up front this year, if we're going into heavy P and K programs for dry, um, you can set up in some cases in the P and K that you can save, you can play, pay for a complete foliar program, control the controllables in the middle of the season uh, and not be all out, up, out front on, on cost and investment. So if you have questions on that, please do call us. This is not a, an easy topic, but it's one that people are, are, are using more and more all the time and, and doing very, very well with. Um, and we put a feather in our cap knowing that people, when we tell people what to see and what to expect on foliars, uh, probably if you interview most of our people, 80% of them are going to tell you that 80% of the time they are seeing exactly what we're telling them to look for. Uh, and that is very rewarding in a business that uh, in some cases is really happy with 25% of the time. What, what a sad, sad commentary. So if you have questions, please call us here at uh, area code 260-478-8080. Or check us out on the web at uh, SPNC Corp. That's two C's in the middle, spncorp.com. Uh, and uh, I, myself or one of our salespeople will get a hold of you and, and help you put together uh, an idea for a foliar program for the, uh, for the next upcoming season.